Hello, welcome to the Courageous Self-Care Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Marlette. On this show, we talk about self-care of all kinds. You know, I was looking on Amazon the other day, not the other day, this morning, woo, <laughs> and I saw a book about self-care, and it was a list of 150 or so things you could do for self-care. And while I'm sure it was full of fantastic suggestions, I perused it a little bit, it is part of the problem, thinking that if we only take care of our bodies, that is complete self-care. And that is a mistake. What we want to do is practice both internal and external self-care. We do need to pay attention to what's going on on the inside of us as well as the outside. And so that is what this podcast is about. It is about finding harmony between doing stuff that will make your body feel great And it is also about doing stuff that will make the rest of you feel great. Not that we even want to separate that. We want to look at ourselves as a whole human being where we don't separate the spiritual part of ourselves. We don't separate the emotional part of ourselves. We don't separate the physical and the mind. What I like to do is perceive it as a whole human being. So today I want to talk about something along those lines using us an experience that happened to me recently and I'm calling it the goose in distress a self-care parable I don't know if it's actually a parable but it's a story that is a teaching story so I guess that's a parable right okay so the other day I was walking to the sportsplex I live nearby and uh to take care of my physical body and I heard this really weird bird call. We have all sorts of birds around here. We're right near the river in Calgary. So many different birds, but I had not heard this call before. And I was curious. I looked all around. It was super loud. And eventually I saw this Canada goose on the hill right near where I was walking. I don't know if you are familiar with Canada geese. They're very loud. They're quite large. And I recognize their call generally because they're flying over our place all the time. They're around the river. I know what Canada geese sound like, but this one did not sound like a Canada goose at all. So here's what regular Canada geese sound like. That is the sound I'm used to. Now, I don't have a sound for or a recording of what this goose sounded like because I was even looking for goose calls and uh, this one never even showed up. So I'll do my best to um, (laughs) reenact it for you. It was something like this. (laughs) But not really. (laughs) But you can hear how it was different from what it normal Canada goose sounds sound like. And I watched it for a little while. It was all by itself, which is kind of unusual, especially this time of year. Geese tend to be in pairs and it was shaking and kind of bobbing its neck up and down and shaking its head. And it seemed to me like it was in distress. So I went to my workout class and then thought, Uh, I thought about it as I was coming home and it was still there and it was still doing the same thing. But then the next time I went a day later, it was gone. So I don't know what happened to the goose in distress. But the whole time I was at my, not the whole time, part of the time I was at my spin class, I was thinking about this goose and how it is so interesting to compare it to what we do with self-care. Now, one of the main mistakes, there are three main mistakes I find people tend to make with self-care, and one of them is trying to do everything ourselves. The solution, of course, is seeking help, asking an expert or reading books by experts, getting someone to help coach you through things. That's how you learn the best. You cut the learning curve dramatically, you reduce the amount of time, you reduce your suffering. And we don't tend to do that. So here's what I noticed about this distressed goose. I'm guessing it was distressed. 
that I, I don't know for sure, but it sure seemed like it. So here's what I noticed about this goose. It was calling for help. And the thing about geese and pretty much all other animals in the animal kingdom that I know about anyways, no one came to help it. No other geese thought, oh, there's a goose in distress. I'm going to go figure out how I can help it. This goose was alone, which I already said was a little bit out of the ordinary, especially for this time of year. I feel like there's a lot of mating going on and uh, protecting of the um, eggs and nests and babies and that kind of thing. So no other goose came to help. I thought, isn't that interesting? And then I thought, if a human did come to help, the goose would most likely attack. Even though it was in distress, it wouldn't know that the human was coming to help. It would feel threatened. So I thought that was interesting. And then the other thing is that even if the some goose came to help the distressed goose, it, uh, it wouldn't really be able to help. Like I'm guessing that this goose had something stuck in its throat, which is why it couldn't honk properly and why it kept shaking its head. So if another goose did have the instinct to help, which they don't, but if it did, the, I don't think that it could have uh, rescued this bird. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Humans are different. We know how to ask for help. Uh, we have our own distress calls. And interestingly enough, even though we have that ability, we don't use it very effectively for the most part. I'm making generalizations. If you are fantastic at asking for help, then take what you want from this story. But for most, especially women that I observe and work with, I notice that the asking for help skill is underdeveloped. Another thing about humans that is different from geese and other animals is that we want to help each other. We're not really uh, so much in competition with each other. We, we do have the ability to help each other out. And it is something that is deeply satisfying to us. We do want to help. And yeah, that's just innate. We want to be able to make life better for each other. One thing that is similar to us and this distressed goose is that sometimes... When someone offers to help, we attack and we get defensive. So I thought that was an interesting parallel. But mostly we are different from geese because we have the ability to ask for help. There are people who do want to help us. There are people who make their living out of helping each other. And for the though I'd say a lot of careers and jobs are focused on helping other human beings and helping the environment and helping animals and that kind of thing. But we do have this desire to help. And we also do have the ability to receive it when we learn to let our guard down and not attack or be defensive or think that we need to do everything ourselves. So I th those are some similarities and differences that just got me thinking when I heard this distressed goose. Isn't it interesting that we have this gift of being able to help? We have the gift of being able to make ourselves clear that we do need help, and yet we don't necessarily use that skill as much as we could. So I want to go through the self-care process that I've been talking about for the last few episodes that has three steps on how we can shift out of this idea that asking for help is a sign of weakness and turn it into the reality that asking for help is a sign of great strength. It's also a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of... Um, yeah, strength and intelligence. I think that's uh, those are great reasons to ask for help. We don't need to do everything by ourselves. We often do that, though. I see friends, I have this one friend in particular who, although she's married, her husband is very busy with some new work, and he 
is away from the family more than he is with the family. And so my friend, who has several children, has gone into survival mode. And she was telling me how she's responsible for everything to do with the kids now. All the driving back and forth to school, all the meal preparation, all the cleanup, all the laundry, all of the everything. And she just, her energy was not the same as it usually is. She was depleted. She was exhausted. She was totally running on empty. And I I wanted to help. So I did offer and I didn't hear anything back. So that kind of makes me think of this goose incident. I, I heard a distress call and I wanted to come in and do what I could to make things a little bit easier. And she didn't attack me, but she ignored me. So that is, uh, I think it's interesting. So let's go into this three-step self-care process on how you can shift out of the mindset that you do have to do everything yourself, or if you are in survival mode and you do feel like you've got tons of responsibilities and it's all up to you and you are the only one who can do it properly. No one else can do it as well as you can, so you might as well not even ask. These are all things I'm speaking from experience. I am definitely someone who is still working on the many layers of asking for help. So I've gotten better at noticing when I do need help and I've definitely gotten better at receiving it when it's being offered and then there are other times where it is still a challenge because it's just nose to the grindstone I'm gonna make this happen and if I just focus on it I can do it without any help so it's a work in progress delegation is definitely something that has not come naturally to me so I continue to work on it and the universe often gifts me with situations where I can relearn that asking for help is a sign of strength not a sign of weakness and when we get other people involved we're giving them a gift to be able to contribute and help because boy does it feel good to contribute and make a difference in someone else's life so in survival mode or even before you're in survival mode, that's usually the best time to plan. It's when we get into it, we can have blinders on and not even realize we're in it. I want to give you the three steps of how you can learn to ask for help so that you don't feel like you have to do everything yourself or you don't feel like it is a sign of weakness. So the first step is to pause and get curious. Pause and get curious. And I recommend actually making a list. You could think about it, but writing it down would be even better. And answer the this question. What do you need help with? So if you have a whole bunch of different things on your plate, or your plate is so overflowing that you don't have even a plate, you have a buffet table, and there is a ton of stuff on it for you to do, make a list. What is it that would actually help you? Is it something to do with housework? Is it something to do with childcare? Is it something to do with having someone to talk to who can empathize? Write down what it is that would make your life just even a little bit easier. If you could get one task off your plate or your buffet table, what would that be? But ideally make a list. And I challenge you to make a list of about 10 things. Okay, so that is getting curious. What is it that would make, that would lighten your load? And ideally, you're going to want to get rid of the stuff that you really don't like doing. Because as much as you don't like doing it, there will be someone out there who actually loves doing it. Or you can pay someone to do it for you. There are so many different options, but you don't necessarily have to shell out money to get help. That is one option. But there are other solutions. So getting curious if you could get rid of one or more things on your list, 
what would they be? So make that list, write it down, get curious and open your mind. So if you're brainstorming and then you start censoring yourself, oh, well, no, I'm sure no one would want to do that. I couldn't ask anyone to do that. No, just write it down because one idea will lead to the next. So I encourage you to take step one and get curious and make that list. Next, step two is get connected. step of getting connected in the self-care process, I want you to think about who could you connect with who might be willing to help you. I have another friend who had a beautiful demonstration of this recently. She was selling her house after getting divorced and was going through a tough time, but she got courageous and she put out a message to her network saying, I need help cleaning my house. Is there anyone who could contribute for half an hour, an hour, half a day? I will accept any help. I have a list of things to be done. I will feed you. And she put that out there. I thought that was such a beautiful example of courageous self-care. She could have definitely cleaned the house by herself, but there was no reason for her to do that. And because she was so courageous, I felt compelled to help her. So I enlisted my family and we went over and contributed a couple of hours, which between the four of us ended up being like eight hours worth of help. And we made a huge difference. We felt good doing it. And I wanted to acknowledge the courage that it took for her to ask because she just like so many women is definitely someone who in the past has tried to do most things herself but she decided why why do I need to suffer and do this all by myself so she courageously connected and she made a big list of people who could help her and a lot of them showed up some stayed and cleaned the entire three days that she asked and others came like us here and there and did what we could. So that is a great way to get connected. So along with your list of what you could delegate, you can also make a list of who you know, and again, not censoring it, who you know who could potentially help you with one or more of the things on your list. And you can put out a call on social media, you could make phone calls, you could send a text, and giving a little bit of an explanation like this friend did, saying, I just, I need some help. This is not the way I usually do things, but I've realized that I just can't do everything myself, and so I'm looking for people who could help me. And it might be an ongoing thing, or it might be a one-time thing, like this house cleaning thing. So that you can, it can help you get out of survival mode so that it can help you take a breath and pause and reclaim some of your energy rather than powering through for who knows how long. So that is step two, get connected, write down a list of who you know that could help you. And I encourage you to have both your A list, like your go-to people, your good friends, and then also a B list, like people that you kind of know who, um, yeah, who aren't the people you necessarily hang out with all the time, but people you do know and have connected with in the past. Because what I found is often those people will be even more helpful than the ones you would think that you could count on. So having that second list as a go-to is really a great idea. All right, so got curious by writing down the tasks that could help you out. You got connected by thinking of who you could actually connect with. And then step three is get creating. Let's not get creative get creating. This is an action step. This is putting into practice and combining what you discovered in steps one and two. Get creating means taking the action, even if there is fear involved, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's scary, putting yourself out there and taking that action to ask for help. Otherwise, 
Nothing's going to change. And that step is pretty self-explanatory. It, and it's the hardest because if you are, if you have been brought up to think that being strong and independent is the best way to get things done, then you're going against a lifetime of belief patterning and habitual thoughts. And so the other thing that's important in this step is to imagine how you will feel once you have alleviated some of the pressure, once you have received some of that help, once you have had a chance to pause and feel more energetic. Imagine how good that's going to feel. Visualize it. Feel the relief. And then take the courageous step to move through that fear so you can get to the other side and experience that lightness and energy and feeling good about yourself for doing something that was uncomfortable. The other thing, so this is all about asking for help. The other thing is also to receive help when it is presented to you, even if you feel like you don't need it. And this can be as simple as allowing someone to open a door for you. It can be as simple as if you drop something, having allowing someone else to pick it up. It can be as simple as, well, any kind of help that's coming your way, even when you think you don't need it. So the story that comes to mind is my sister uh, was a teacher, is a teacher, and she had a cart that she needed to trundle down the hallway from one place, one classroom to the next. She didn't have her own classroom. She was moving in between classrooms. And so she would pile all her stuff on her trolley and make her way through the sea of high school students. And one day, uh, a high school boy asked if she would like some help and if he could push the trolley for her. And her standard response up until that point had been, no, no, I'm good. I can handle it. Sound familiar? And instead that day, I think she and I had been discussing something about receiving help. And instead that day, she decided to do something different, and she received the gift. And she walked through the sea of kids with the boy happily pushing the trolley behind her. And when she got to her other classroom and realized what a huge thing it was for her to have let go of that need to do everything herself, she felt amazing. She told me about this story because not only was it easier for her to get from one place to the next, the smile on the boy's face made it so worthwhile. He had wanted to help. He had wanted to contribute to her. He saw that she was struggling and he knew that he could make a difference. And when she allowed that in, it wasn't that she pushed him away, which we tend to do when someone offers help. We say, no, I'm good. It's it's rejection and it doesn't feel that good when someone's offering to help even if you feel like you don't need it practice saying yes and receiving it and notice how different the outcome is than if you would have done it yourself all that has come out of my experience of seeing and hearing this solo goose, the goose in distress. So I think the moral of the story, if we're going with a parable, is that there is no need for us to behave like a goose in distress or a different animal in distress. We have the capacity to ask for help clearly. We have the capacity to receive help and we have the capacity to help each other. So that is the message I wanted to get across to you today. Self-care is asking for and receiving help when it's being offered and when it's not being offered. Taking those three steps to get out of survival mode. There is absolutely no reason that we need to live there, that we need to do everything ourselves, that we need to have our nose down and our blinders on and force and power and struggle through. It's just not necessary. And I did want to mention, or I I did mention a little bit, that sometimes we want to pay people for their help. That's another option. So there 
there are always options and your mind will make up a thousand and one excuses on why you can't ask for help and you can't afford it and you can't do it. But really, if you are able to pay someone to do something for you that you don't like to do, that takes you away from doing the stuff that would actually make a bigger difference, like let's say instead of if you're someone who really doesn't like cooking and you would rather go out um, and that's what you often end up doing, what if you hired a meal planner or got on a program where meals are delivered to your house that are wholesome and healthy and then instead of either cooking if that's something you don't like to do or going out and spending a lot of money on restaurants, you could actually save money and then spend more time doing what you're doing rather than waiting at restaurants or traveling to restaurants, or doing all the meal prep yourself, if this is just an example, if this is something that you don't like to do, wouldn't it make energetic sense to have an expert help you with that, who actually loves doing it? Absolutely. And at the same time, it doesn't have to cost you anything. So there, there's the opportunity to be creative, like my friend who was moving. She didn't pay someone to pack up and clean her house. She asked her community. And so there are all of those different solutions. I encourage you to brainstorm and not censor and do those three steps. Get curious, get connected, and get creating because that is true self-care in action. I hope that this has been helpful for you. I invite you to check out the self-care quiz. This is a resource I've created if you haven't taken it before. A quiz to help you learn more about yourself and where you're at with courageous self-care, which is different from what we normally think of as self-care. So you can go to selfcarequiz.com and take the quiz. I think you will be um, either delighted or surprised at all the different ways that you are already practicing courageous self-care or the ways that you never even thought were self-care that you could start to implement. So I encourage you to take that quiz. And the other thing I want to invite you to is a resource I've created called the Courageous Self-Care Community. It is actually filled with experts who you can ask questions to on a regular basis. We have a different expert most days of the month. You can get personal answers. You can use the community to celebrate wins. You can ask the Um, for support from the community and I am doing a lot of teaching in there around courageous self-care beyond what I am doing in the podcast so I invite you to become a member of that community it is a, a fantastic place to really immerse yourself in the skills of courageous self-care so that you know how to prioritize your own well-being without feeling guilty And so that you are having the maximum amount of energy and joy and vitality in your life. Thank you so much for listening. I do look forward to connecting with you again next time. Bye-bye for now.